boys and girls. You guys ready? All right, we've been talking about, if you're visiting here, we've been talking about the different names of God. I said in the beginning, um, plagiarizing all this stuff. <laughs> I've learned it. I've read many, many books. I've learned it. I've learned it for years and years and years. Um, I was talking with our boy Ken over there. He also knows the names of God pretty good. I could probably get through this whole series and have Ken come up and do the whole series again and you get more out of it. So there's just so much. I'm just giving us a, a snippet, if you will. I encourage you to understand it yourself, read the word yourself. And for those of you who struggle with this, because I know there's some people who struggle with this, because the Bible just says the Lord. So it says the Lord. What are you talking about? It's the Lord. Well, that's why I said a billion times, the worst thing that's ever happened to the word of God is English. English has messed up the word of God. If you look at it in the original language, if you took the time to get a concordance or look it up or ask questions, the original language, when them words Lord, it would be all these different names, all these different names that he said, you know, Jehovah, like we've talked about. We talked about the first three. Who remembers them? Elohim? Adonai? Who was in the middle? Jehovah. Then we talked about what? Jehovah who? Jehovah Jireh. He was our provider. This week we're going to talk about Jehovah Saba. It's spelled T-S-A-B-A, -A, but the T is silent. Jehovah Saba. I know a good way to say what it means is the Lord our warrior. The Lord our warrior. So when I was writing this, I was reminded of something in 9-11. Remember 9-11? That was quite a day in America. Some of you guys, all of you guys here are old enough to remember it. I remember watching that like it was yesterday, like it was today. I can remember exactly what was happening. Me and my wife, Jody, were on the, we were at home. We were watching the morning news, getting ready to come into the office. And uh, all of a sudden, the scene broke from the, some plane crashed into the first tower. And, you know, we were sitting there, wow, you know, we're just watching it. Man, that's jacked up, some plane. How, how's the plane? We're asking all the questions. I wonder what happened. Did the guy fall asleep? You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, not thinking anything at the time until the second plane hit. When we were watching it and the second plane hit, I remember just like I said it this morning, I said, holy cow, Joe, we're under attack. We're under attack. And the next thing that came out of my mouth, I said, I bet you it's that Bin Laden guy. And I just said that. I just said that because, you know, he was looming, man. He's been looming for a long time. You know, he tried to assassinate uh, President um, uh, Bill Clinton. He tried to assassinate Clinton. So he's been looming. A lot of people think he just kind of popped up on 9-11. Now, he's been in trouble for a long time, that guy. But that day, I remember like it was today. It changed my life. It changed, I think, everybody's life, right? When that second plane hit. Since that day, the giant of terrorism has taunted, if you will, our trained military. They've been having to deal with this stuff on, a, like a, like on steroids ever since that day. It got worse and worse and worse. Like, it was like the uh, proverbial you know, door was open. The floodgates of terrorism were opened. The thing about it, though, is that this kind of stuff battles according to a different set of rules. Once they crashed into the towers, once they did the, they, the Pentagon and all that stuff happened, the rules were changed. Terrorism changed. Terrorism changed. That, that's kind of a stupid thing to say. But you understand what I mean? It became on a different level at that point. You see, it, it didn't discriminate its victims were cross-age, cross-racial, cross-economic, gender lines. They crossed every line after that. It wasn't just that they were killing themselves, because that's terrorism kind of focused on that part of the world. 
and they would, you know, they, they really killed themselves a lot. Now, they were like, here we are, and we're, go we're not going away. It opened up to the entire world, and they didn't care what you were, who you were. If you were against what they believed, you were a target. It was a, it was a brutal. It's a brutal giant that rules through fear and intimidation. That's their whole gig, fear and intimidation. And a lot has changed after our nation met that giant. Let's be honest. The fabric of our land experienced a rip, a tear, if you will, in the very fabric of this country. Seems like it's not going away anytime soon, neither, does it? In fact, some people in our country, if we can be honest, can we be honest this morning? Still look at people from the Middle East a certain way. Can we be honest? When they walk into a store, when they're standing in line, what kind of thoughts go through your head? I don't know. You've got to answer that question yourself. Some people are still reluctant to get on planes. And if we're really honest this morning, if you're sitting on a plane and somebody who looks like them gets on the plane, then what happens? What goes through your head? What goes through your head? It's sad, right? But it's true. It's true. A giant isn't easy to forget. And it's certainly not easy to take down. Our next name of God is found in a story about the most infamous giant in history. What's his name? Goliath. Goliath. Our boy Goliath. In 1 Samuel, we come across possibly the most famous representative battle in history. You know what I mean by representative battle? A representative battle is when you have two armies and they pick one person from this side and one person, person from this side, and they say, let's get it on. And whoever wins, that whole army wins. Whoever loses, that whole army loses. That's what we come across here. On one side stands a warrior. No joke warrior, big, ugly man whose name brought terror into everybody who heard it. Everybody back then knew who Goliath was. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. Nine feet, nine feet, nine inches tall. Goliath came from Gath. And I'm pretty sure he drooled when he talked. <clears throat> big, ugly, big, no joke, warrior, ready to go. He was absolutely ready to go. On the other side stands a young boy. A young boy, no armor. In fact, Goliath's armor probably weighed more than David. There he was. He probably came up to about here on Goliath. Young kid, young guy. Big giant. Goliath came from this rare dying breed of giants with a serious reputation to keep even an army at bay. Some people think he came from creatures called the Nephilim. I, per I particularly don't, because the Nephilim would have died in the flood. I think he was just a big dude, big, mean old dude. Maybe, who knows? That's what I think. Goliath's presence dominated. There he stood, nine feet, nine inches tall, his supersized frame draped with armor that weighed 175 pounds. His armor weighed 175 pounds. We pick the story up in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's flip over there. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll start in verse 5. We there? Okay, he, that's Goliath. He had a bronze helmet 
on his head and wore a goat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield, shield bearer went ahead of him. So here is big old Goliath. Big old spear. Big old armor. Big old shield. Big everything. Just plain big, right? No doubt Goliath was a bad dude. Ready. So this battle takes place between the Israelites and the Philistines. They were fighting over land. They were fighting over servants. They were fighting, very, they were fighting over the well-being and survival of their people. It was a fight for freedom. Listen, guys, freedom's never free. Freedom's never free. The two armies stood on either side of the valley facing one another until one man, Goliath, he's referred to as the champion. That means he didn't lose. The champion came forward with a challenge. Same chapter, verses 8 and 9. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Now that's quite the challenge. Nine foot nine. Who's going? <laughs> They're like, crap. <laughs> what do we do now? What do we do now? You see, this was a game changer. Besides the threats and difficulty, difficulties, it only got worse when one giant stepped forward. One giant. He was only one giant, but one giant is one giant too many, ain't it? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Might be only one giant, but one giant is one giant too many. Most of us can handle the regular problems and challenges in life, right? We can handle the mundane, normal stuff. We can e I can even handle when I can't find the remote for about three minutes. If it goes longer than three minutes, though, it becomes a giant. <laughs> right? But when that one giant shows up, it changes everything, doesn't it? It changes. Bless you. Nothing is said about Israel fearing this battle until the giant showed up. If you read before this, they're not saying they're afraid. They're standing there. They're like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then old Goliath comes out. And now look what happens. Verse 11. Let's follow the story. You with me that back there already? You following the story? <laughs> On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. On hearing this big old dude step forward, saying, here I am, who do you got? Bring it on. Now the whole army's afraid. The whole army. This unexpected twist of events left Israel at a serious disadvantage. Why? They didn't have a giant. The Philistines had a giant. They had normal people. What do we do now? What do we do now? Nobody's willing to step up and fight this guy because nobody thinks they can beat him. And if they lose, the whole nation loses. The Philistines, on the other hand, they're like, yeah, buddy. We ain't even got to break a sweat today. Oh, Goliath got it. Goliath got us. You with me? 
See, you know you're in a giant size battle, not only by the size, but also by the effect it has on you. I just said something there. You know you're in a giant size battle, not only by the size, but also by the effect it has on you. The Israelites were afraid. And because of their fear, they became paralyzed. That's what fear does. That's why God hammers it. Hammers it. Do not fear. Do not fear. You have not been given a spirit of fear. Lo, I am with you, even to the ends of the earth. Look to me, look to me, look to me. Do not fear. Every time an angel popped up. Why? Because angels can be scary. Big. Some of them are real big. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Fear forces me to look at my problem, and I can't even see the solution. Fear makes me listen to the doctor and not listen to the Lord. Fear causes us to divide and be separated. Just look how the world is right now. They've been stirring up fear. People have been biting. And now we're separated. Do not fear. Fear paralyzes us. Has the fear of a giant ever gripped you so much to such a degree that it prevented you from going forward? You ever been at that place where you're stuck, you can't even get off the couch? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? Hello. Whenever this happens, the giant is now controlling the shots. He is now calling the shots. He is now in control of the game. He's dictating your emotion, and he's dictating the way you act or the way you don't act. He's dictating your actions or the lack of action. But make no mistake about it, he's running the show. He is now in charge. Anybody thinking here this morning? Got anybody thinking? The giant sets the agenda, and it won't go away. Listen to me, church. It won't go away just like Goliath of Gath. He wouldn't go away. He was relentless. Relentless. Day after day, Goliath taunted them. Every day. Night after night, they lay awake in fear, knowing that they had nothing for this guy. What are we going to do? Who's going down there? Who's going to fight this guy? He was relentless. Verse 16. Look what it says. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. 40 days every day. You ready? What do you got? Who's coming down? What are you scared? Where's your God? Hello. I'm here. But then old David showed up with lunch for the boys, didn't he? Old David shows up with lunch for his brothers. David's a rock star, man. I, I think he's my favorite, even more than Paul. He's just so awesome, man. Remember that Bible study? I'll never forget that Bible study we did at, at Claire, not Claire, um, Clara, Clara's house. Now, keep in mind that perspective is never just what you see. Right, Ken? Ken knew this. Ken knows this whole sermon. He does. Perspective is the key to knowing and implying the character of God's names in order to live an abundant life. This is why God is doing what he's doing. This is why we're talking about what we're talking about. Because God reveals little pieces of himself. So because we, again, let me say it, we're incapable of grasping the totality of God. He's too big. So God just, because he knows, 
This is not an, ex an, ex an exhaustive list. I found these results. Oh, shut up, baby. <laughs> it's not an exhaustive list, even in the Bible. There's still more to God that someday we'll understand. But he knows how much of him we need now. He knows how much of him we need to be sufficient for us to live this life called Christianity and to make it through life, okay? So perspective is a key to knowing and applying the character of God's names in order to live an abundant life. The Israelites saw the same giant David saw, didn't they? They just didn't see him the same way. This is the Gipper right here, guys. The Israelites looked at his size. They looked at his strength. They looked at his armor. They looked at his big head. They looked at the size of his, his shield. They looked how big his, his spear was. They looked at the circumstances. David looked straight ahead, the Bible says. See, they're looking up. Holy cow, look how big this dude is. Look at him. David looked straight ahead. The word of God points that out. David looked straight ahead, zeroing in on a very critical reality. They didn't see this. Verse 26. He's with me? David asked the men standing near, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, everyone else saw how big the giant was. But because David knew God and because David knew the power of his name, he had a different perspective. David saw something much more important than everyone else. You see, he saw that this giant hadn't been to the doctor. Unless that's Jesus calling. Please turn your phone off. Jesus, Jesus, David saw that this guy hasn't been to the doctor. What am I talking about? No circumcision means only one thing. No supernatural covering. No covenant. Who is this uncircumcised giant? Who is this guy? To be circumcised validated the covenant between God and his people. It signified that you belong to this covenant. But more important, it positioned you underneath the covenant's provision, power, and covering. Hallelujah. David knew where he stood. David understand his position. David understood the power that was available to him. David understood who had him. But he also stood that none of that applied to that big old nine foot nine inch goon. Are you with me? Hallelujah. To be uncircumcised meant that the power of God's name was not on your side. He's a pagan. The Israelites looked up. They saw Goliath's size. David looked straight ahead. He didn't look up and said, look at him. Look how big he is. He didn't look up. He said, I got this because God got this. This guy hasn't been cut. This guy is not under, in covenant with us. Many of us today crumble in the shadow of a giant for the same reason. We look at the wrong thing. Eyes, we look at the wrong thing. We look at the size of the giant without evaluating its status. And when we do that, we allow the size of the giant 
to eclipse the size of God. And that's how we lose our battles, church. That's how we all lose our battles. The men saw Goliath. David saw God. Two do totally different things, wouldn't you say? Sometimes God will allow you to experience a bigger than life Goliath so you can experience a bigger than Goliath God. But you will never experience the bigger than Goliath God if your eyes are focused on the bigger than life Goliath. Giants rule many of our hearts and homes today because we've lost the ability to look beyond what we see in order to view the spiritual reality that's surrounding it. Many of us focus on the circumstance and then try to figure out what we're going to do. If we miss the uncircumcision because we're looking at the height, we'll continue to be overrun and intimidated by the giant in our lives. Perspective is everything, church. Let me read you something out of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. And verses 4 to 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up. Church, perspective. Do we know who we are? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace uh, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Guys, do you know where you sit? Do you know where you are? Do you know your position? Hallelujah! We need to know where we're seated, church. Why? So we can access the power in God's name. If we don't know who we are, then this is what we are. Beat up, busted up, messed up, can't get it together. That's not God's plan for anybody in this room. We're seated with Christ. We are seated with Christ. The reality, that ought, reality ought to change the way we view any Goliath in our lives. Anything we're facing. About 500 men came to arrest Jesus in the garden. Imagine, how would you have felt? How would you have 500 cops banging on your door? <clears throat> I've had a few, but I never had 500. But let me tell you, when the few banged, I was a little scared. 500 walk up to him, they say, you the guy? He goes, I am. That's right, I am. And they all fall down. They all fall down. We're seated with Christ, church. Goliath doesn't look so big when you view him from heaven. <laughs> we can save a lot of time and energy dealing with the giants that we face by learning how to view things from our actual location and not just our physical location. David was looking at the same guy the whole army of Israel was looking at. He said, I got this guy. Who 
who is this? He said, help me to purge this filth. <laughs> he said. You know where David got his confidence to defeat the giant? He got it from what he saw. He got it from what he saw. You see, if you're looking at your giant every day and say, I can't do this, I can't get over it, I can't get free from it, it's too big, I don't know what to do, you're looking at it from a wrong perspective. You're looking at it from a wrong seat. We can save a lot of time and energy dealing with the giants that we face by learning how to view things from our actual location, church. I'll tell you something too, man. One way to approach your giants is by trying to use some, one, I'll tell you something, one way not to approach your giants is by trying to use someone else's anointing. Saul tried to put his armor on David, didn't he? He said, it don't fit, man. I don't need that. What am I going to wear that crap for? You can't expect to win your battle in someone else's armor. Many people try. Many. I deal with a lot of people in, in, in recovery and addictions. They all think I have this magic potion. You know, I'm supposed to like sprinkle fairy dust on them and boom, you never want to use again the rest of your life. <clears throat> Doesn't work like that, church. Doesn't work like that. And another thing, guys, you can't let someone else force his armor on you. You got to get your armor. You got to find your armor. They are tailor fitted. Just because it worked for them doesn't mean that's the way God's going to do it for you. A kingdom life is not a cookie cutter life. God has a unique way he wants to take you to your destiny. Right? Your destiny. Not my destiny. Why would you want my destiny? It won't work for you anyway. Never fall into the trap of wearing Saul's armor. Instead, clothe yourself in the power of God's names. God's name for you. For you. You have to seek God out. You have to put in the time. You have to read the word of God. You have to find out what God wants for you. Nobody can hear for you. Recognize and use the strength God has given you. Because they're more than enough for your life. Resist the temptation to copy someone else. That'll just frustrate you. When David approached Goliath, he did it with what he knew and with what he had. Check it out. Verse 40. Go back to 1 Samuel. 17, where you at, 1 Samuel, right there, in verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approaches Goliath. Now, mind you, where is David standing? Who's behind them? The whole army of Israel. He had a plethora, spears, hatchets, whatever they had back then. He could have had things lined up, everything he wanted. He said, I don't need your stuff. I'm going to use what I got. I'm going to use my ability. I'm going to use my anointing. I'm going to use what God has given me. 
It drives me crazy, man, when I see people who struggle with things, addictions, whatever they, and they say, well, somehow it was easier for me than it was for them. Or somehow, you know, they could do it, but I can't do it. You can't do it because you don't know how to do it. I could get with that. But to say you can't do it because you're not capable of doing it, I cannot get with that. Cannot. <laughs> David faced the challenges with what he had confidence in himself. And he was confident in his victory because of what he knew. The giant isn't covered by the covenant. So David now approached the giant. The Israelites went the other way when Goliath approached them. They went on the defense. If you read the whole story, it says that Goliath was yelling across the valley. Then it says Goliath was down in the valley and he was yelling up to the Israelites. Then it says he walks up and he's in the camp and he's taunting the Israelites. Guys, Fear keeps you at bay. It paralyzes you. And it also gives the enemy more confidence, more leverage, and it just keeps coming. Goliath left that side, walks this side, walks up this side, and now he's right in the face. His mistake was he runs face to face in with this little guy, covered with the anointing of God, confident in what God can do through him. The enemy ain't as smart as we give him credit for. Look, let's look what happened. It's an awesome story. So Goliath approaches. They go on the defense. Oh, by the way, armor, there's no armor on the back. Armor's only for the front. Armors for moving forward. If you turn and run, you get stabbed in the back and die. A child of the king conquers his giants when he goes on the offense, which is exactly what David did. Let's check it out. Verse 42. I love this story, man. Can you tell? He looked David over, this giant. See, this is what the devil tries to do. He tries to intimidate him, us. Especially when, you know, everybody's cowering in fear. So when you cower in fear, now he's really got you, right? He's got you now. So he looks at old David, saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, like me. <laughs> and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And a Philistine cursed David by his gods. G O small G. He curses David by his gods. Goliath took one look at David and he thought, this must be some kind of a joke. You're kidding, right? I'm Goliath, the champion. You're sending a boy here? Then he curses David. Right? David didn't get shook up. He didn't cow. He looks right at him. He says this. You ready? Verse 45 to 47. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. But my man, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the name of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistines' army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world we know that there is a God in Israel. Hallelujah. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. My man David. My man, David, church, David didn't approach Goliath with the latest technology, right? He didn't pray for a week. 
He didn't get all the other stuff. He didn't motion that, you know, he needed more slingshots, bigger rocks. He didn't do any of that. In fact, he didn't even mention that I'm going to take you out with a slingshot. He, he, don't even, he don't even bring that up, right? David said, came in the name of the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Saba. Today, the Lord, my warrior, is going to knock you silly, brother. Today, everyone will see, everyone gathered here will see the power of my God. Hallelujah. Awesome story, man. God's name was enough for David to win because David knew God's name was more than just a simple name. It was the gateway to his power. We throw away, the, we throw around the name of God like it's, you know, like we're shooting dice. Because we really don't know. We don't know, man, what God is saying to us. Guys, the names of God come with certain benefits and privileges. That's for sure. He has issued us the authority to use them in line, hello, with his will. So don't go saying in the name of Jehovah Jireh, I claim this $10 million lottery prize. It's in his will. If I'm in the will of God, I have so much power available to me, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. But when I'm out of his will, and see, when I'm out of his will, when I'm sinning, let's call it what it is, is and then I expect God to move, uh-uh, it doesn't work like that. There's no power there. See, I need to repent and get back under God's covering. I need to repent and get back in the will of the Lord. When I'm out of the will of the Lord, it's a waste of time. Just be quiet. Go live your life. When you're done, hopefully you won't die. Get right. Get right. Powerful names, uniquely crafted for any situation that we will find ourselves in. Anyone. His names can get us into places we never could have entered, certainly not on our own. And he can give us power to defeat the giants in our life, any giant. There's no giant too big for God. By advancing in God's name, David now positions himself to defeat someone who everyone thought was undefeatable. In fact, nobody even thought David was going to win this battle. They were just so out of uh, options. Well, I'll let the little kid go. At least we'll, you know, give us a little time. <laughs> give us a little time. Maybe we could figure something else out. Because, you know, he's just going to rip this kid in half. Right? By advancing in God's name, David essentially handed the ball off. Any football fans here? You see, when a quarterback receives the hike from center, right? The defensive line rushes him. All eyes are on him at that point. The opposing team makes every, every effort to tackle the quarterback while he has the ball. But what happens the minute he gets rid of the ball? As soon as he hands the ball off or throws the ball, the defense now shifts. And now everybody goes after the guy with the ball. The quarterback, they don't even care about him at that moment. Right? You get me? You get me. David, hello, approaches Goliath in the full power of God's name. What he did essentially was he handed the ball off. He said, here, Lord, have at it. Have at it. Now David, now Goliath's fight wasn't with this little kid anymore. Now Goliath's fight was the guy with the ball. Now his fight was against him. David, he's just an observer now, much like a quarterback. Once the quarterback hands the ball off, he's just an observer at that point. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see if my call works. David said, yeah, let me see if my call works. Here you go. Am I getting to you? Mm -hmm. 
David said, I come to you in the name of Jehovah Saba. The name Saba essentially means army or hosts. David recognized God's supremacy in this situation rather than trying to handle it himself. There was no I in David. I got this. I'll get him. I'll take him out. There was none of that. Read the story. He gave the battle over to the Lord. But church, it didn't mean that he sat down and did nothing. Let's get, let's get to the meat of the potato here. Okay? Because so often, that's what we do. We pray, and then that's it. We pray. See, he did all that he could do. And, but he did it with one truth in mind, that God would give Goliath to his hands. Goliath was taunting God's people, which David knew didn't sit well with the king. He knew that was not right. When I was trying to get over my Goliath called crack cocaine, I knew in my heart of hearts that God is not cool with me being addicted to crack. I knew that. I absolutely knew that. And so when I handed the ball off to him, he said, okay, Frank, follow me. Follow me. But going and crack, buying crack is out of the question. I don't go there. Temptation comes sitting on your couch trying to battle, not going to get high alone. I'm not with that either. I'll take the ball, but you got to follow me. You got to get up and do the work. Many of us, like the Israelites, were so busy trying to figure out how we're going to conquer the giant in our lives. We don't ask ourselves the most important question. You ready for this question? What does God have to say about this? What does God want me to do right now? I guarantee you, 99.9 to 100% of the times, when we're facing our giants and it's, it's getting us to a place where we're going to do the wrong thing, if we would say, Lord, what do you want me to do? It ain't going to be that. It's going to be something else. And I have to do it. I had to do it. Yeah, it takes humility. Yeah, it takes a lot of time, stuff we don't want to do. I heard Vinny say it at meetings many, many times. He goes, you know, I wish I had a uh, six-pack. He says, but I'm probably never going to get it eating pizza and Twinkies. <laughs> if I want a six-pack, I'm going to have to stop eating the Twinkies and the pizzas. Maybe do some push sit-ups. Right? Lord, help me with my finances. All right, well, quit spending money. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> How about you start saving? How about you tithe? How about you save? You know, and then just live in your means. There. Problem solved. <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> when you're wondering how to overcome the opposition in your life, church, things like addiction, fear, low self-esteem, I mean, there's tons of it. And you're thinking the battle is yours. In that case, you're probably not going to succeed. I'm closing right here. Let me read you something out of Ephesians again, that wonderful book. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. We have, a, we have an enemy. We have an enemy that wants us to eat too many Twinkies. 
We have an enemy. He, do, he goes all over, man. He, we have an enemy that wants us to get $30,000 in credit card debt. He has an enemy that wants us to do drugs. We have an enemy that wants us to fight and argue. He want, he, we have an enemy that wants to divide us. He's in it all. It's, it's so crazy. Poor people dealing with, with, with addiction now. They're giving drugs to get off drugs. It makes no sense. I've never seen an alcoholic say, here, drink some alcohol to get off alcohol. I've never seen that before. But yeah, do drugs to get off drugs. <laughs> it's crazy, right? We're smarter than this. We should be. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But you are not smart enough, you are not clever enough or strong enough to beat an enemy from any other that comes from another realm. The enemy that we're fighting is not of this world. And he is real smart. He is real smart. He's gifted. He didn't lose his gifts. He was special when he was in heaven before God threw him out. Our gifts are irrevocable. So are his. He's smart. He's real smart. I'm not capable of beating him on my own. I can't do it. And neither can anybody in this room. But the good news is I don't have to. I don't have to do it. All I got to do is hand off the ball. Here you go, Lord. Take it. I'm too dumb. I'm not strong enough. I'm not crafty enough. Pick a word. Pick a word. The battle belongs to Jehovah Saba. Many of the struggles and challenges we face simply stem from living in a fallen world. I get that. But others are strategies set in motion by Satan to trip us up. He's trying to defeat us, church, and keep us from reaching the place that God would have us go. Accept it. Accept it. Satan got your number. Accept it. You're not smarter than him. He's got the game film. He has studied you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows just what to do to get you to go where you would never think of going. He knows just how to get you to do things that you would never think of doing, not when you're in your right mind. He knows how to paralyze you in fear. He knows how to get you sidetracked with things that look good in order to keep you from God's best. He's the best at taking a turd and wrapping it with bacon. He is absolutely brilliant at taking a curse and making it look like a blessing. He's really good at it. David killed Goliath because he knew he couldn't kill him on his own. That's how he completed the task. He knew he couldn't beat this guy. But he also knew, I don't have to beat this guy. He saw that Goliath was uncircumcised, not in covenant with God. And once he saw the spiritual core of the physical crisis, hello, he could rest on God's willingness to fight with his ability. The giants you face, there's a spiritual thing attached to them. And if you pray about it and seek God about it, he'll reveal it to you. And, and you'll realize, I can't win in the natural something that's spiritual. Addiction is crazy in this world today. The world is pharmacia out of the Bible, witchcraft. That's where we get the word pharmacy from, or pharmaceutical. The word, the root word is witchcraft. It's not of this world. Prayer is absolutely essential. I get it. But rarely is it the only thing God asks us to do. David's rest and confidence led him to a brook. 
to get five stones. It didn't lead him to the prayer tent to hang out for a week and wait for God to do something. Let me read this to you. First Samuel, back there. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Am I? Because you're looking at me like you're, the game's on. I got to go. First Samuel 17, 49 and 50. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone stank, sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. No sword, just what he had. David won with a slingshot. Some of the most incredible things God will ever do in your life will occur when you think you have nothing. Why? So that when God wins the battle, <laughs> we know who won the battle. And when the next giant shows up, guess what? You know who's going to defeat him too. Jehovah Saba. God, my warrior. After David killed the Goliath, it says he put his head on display. Why would he do that? Verse 54. He cuts off that guy's head. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapon in his own tent. He put the head in Jerusalem, but he put the weapon in his tent. David wanted everyone to see Goliath because Goliath wasn't the only giant walking around. He put the head on display to let people know that Jehovah Saba is able to gain the victory and to not fear any giants. But he took the sword and he put it in his house. Why? To remind himself of what God can do in any situation that looks impossible. Hallelujah. Church. God gives us things to share with others, but he also gives us things just for us to remember. They remind us what to do when the next giant shows up. There's going to be another giant. Let's not forget that. David chose to position himself in God's name and he was able to take the giant down. He positioned, himself in, he positioned himself in the power of God's name because he viewed the situation from God's perspective. He had a heavenly mindset in a worldly crisis, and it gave him the faith to fight. Immediately after David's victory, we read that the Philistines became the ones playing defense. Now the giant and his boys are running. The Bible says that they plundered them. They took them down. In other words, they took all of the Philistines' possessions and whatever was originally theirs that the enemy had stolen. God says, I will restore what the locusts have eaten. I'll give you back what was stolen from you if you trust me. If you trust me. The army essentially got back what the enemy took. Guys, when God secures your victory in his name, listen, church, have confidence that his name also has the power to give back to you what the locusts have eaten. God's name covers all, past, present, and future but it essentially covers the giants that taunt you in your life right now. 
trust Jehovah Saba. Trust him. He definitely got you covered, church. But when you ask him to help, he's going to ask you to get involved too. I can't call the Lord on the battlefield and then expect him to, I'm going to go sit down in the hotel room. I got to fight with him. But I can fight with him. And the victory can be mine. You ready? You hear me? You can say amen to that? Amen. Awesome. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance to you, and give you peace. This day and forevermore, and all God's awesome people said, amen. God bless you guys, man.